Hello, I'm Dr. Ron Eglin, and uh, I'm going to talk to you today about great online classes. I'm coming to you from Daytona State College, and what I'm going to do is cover some of the things that you need to know and need to do to make a good online class a great online class. So first, let's look at the prime elements of online courses, okay? And these will actually change over time because right now they're, some of it's tied to the technology, and the technology does change. But the pieces of an online class are the learning management system. And the reason for that is this is what enables you to do a solid online class and organize the things the way you need to organize them. Number two, the course materials. Unlike a regular class where you can sometimes just run into the classroom on the fly using your subject matter knowledge to do a good job, you really have to be organized and have the course materials down and organized well before you walk into the online session, in this case, shooting a video. Third element is interaction. And when I say interaction, I mean interaction between professors and students, students and students, and the different method of, methods of interaction, which can be bulletin boards and chats and Skypes and set all these different types of sessions. And number four, the assessment, because assessment in an online class is much more of a challenge than what you actually have when you're dealing with classes that are live face-to-face -face courses. Doesn't mean you can't do a good job, just means that they're more of a challenge. So first, let's look at the, uh, the learning management system. One thing about the learning management system is you're probably not going to have any control whatsoever over this learning management system. You're teaching at a school, the school uses this piece of software, it's what you're going to use. The good news is that most learning management systems today do a great job of having all the different pieces that you need to do to cre create a great um, experience for the students. Here at Daytona State College, we use Desire to Learn, D2L. It's a great piece of software, but I've used other pieces of software that are also very good. Sometimes you will feel constrained by what the learning management system allows you to do. You may not have exactly the features that you need specifically to do something. In those situations, I don't let that block me. I actually do use external tools. And some of the external tools I use all the time are things like PBWorks. Google, Google has a tremendous number of apps that you, applications that you can use. And I also do maintain a YouTube EDU channel for uh, being able to do the streaming video relatively straightforward manner. So let's start with number two, the course materials. Well, with any type of course that you're teaching at the college level, you really are trying to meet a specific set of course outcomes. And because you're trying to meet a specific set of outcomes, you really need to drop all the way back, look at those outcomes, and figure out how you're going to meet them. Now, one of the ways to figure out how you're going to meet the course outcomes is to take those outcomes and develop them into topics. Because topics can turn into specific lectures and sessions and assignments and assessments that you can use to figure out how you're doing in the course. Okay, So from the course outcomes, topics is typically the next thing that you're going to do to put together. Next thing you need to do is you need to linearize your course. Topics, course is taught in a linear time frame. You go from A to B to C to D over a period of time. And you'll need to do that with your topics also. Now, many of the people who use books, and by the way, we don't use books, um, a lot of books in our engineering technology program here, um, we'll use the, the book itself to linearize this entire fashion. But as you know, most professors will look at the book and say, you know, I don't want to cover it, chapter 1, 2, 3, and 4 in that order. I'm going to go 1, 2, 6, come back to 3. That's still the process of linearizing. But your end product is going to be an outline of the course. That's where you're going to start with actually putting together the real meat of the course. This is the skeleton, and the skeleton has to be pretty solid for a good course. So what we're going to do next is we're going to look at a sample of organizing the course. So here I am looking specifically at a course uh, that um, I teach, um, Applied Database 2. And I'm talking about organization of the course. So this is the website where I actually keep this course organized. And in this case, I'm using a tool called PBWorks. As you can see, the front page contains some information. Here's the instructor, my email address, a little link of an organization that I support uh, called Education for All. Everybody should know that that symbol's for all. And, um, but, but the real meat of this is right here in these course lectures, the organization meet at least, is in this course lectures week by week. So the students can follow week by week what they need to do. And it is just that. 
Here's week one. Okay, week one, we're reviewing concepts from the previous course. There's some required reading. There's some lectures. Each of these lectures is going to go to a video-based lectures, and there is an assignment. Week two, okay, importing data. A little synopsis of what we're going to learn in week two. Reading and reference material. By the way, what I do when I say reading material, reference material is stuff that you might need to help you solve the assignments. Then there's required. That's reading that you're going to be tested on. You need to know it um, because you're going to be tested on it in some manner. Lectures and assignments. Week three, synopsis, reading, lecture, assignments. As you can see, I'm getting into a rhythm of how all this stuff goes together to make it really straightforward and easy for students to be able to follow. One thing you always want to do in online courses is make the course organization as easy as possible for students. And I you know, adopted this philosophy from being an online student, having a busy life and a job and trying to do online work said, you know, it really helps me out if the professor can just have a level of organization that makes it simpler for me to know what's required of me, what I need to go through and do, and not make me have to jump through hoops. So that's why you see things like this. So what you want to do here, um, since we've looked at some, you know, some examples, realize that you're building on an outcome and the activities that go with the class, the assessments that go with the class should have some direct connection to that outcome. And being able to map those things directly to the outcomes of the courses is actually important. And that will help you with keeping the course well organized. Now, just an example of that, lectures, assessments, all going to an outcome. And <clears throat> So, in this case, here's an example. Students will be able to design and optimize the database, lectures that go with this, the assessments that go with this. That was just a typical outcome from a course that I teach. So, let's talk about the lecture video. And I think the lecture video is probably one of the most important aspects of UAB to be able to put together a course. Now, here is the wrong way to do this. Okay, listen to me. Wrong way to do this. Take a video camera and film yourself in the classroom teaching to a regular group of students. That is not the good way to do this. That will give you a decent course. Maybe even a good course if you're a good lecturer. It will not create a great course. A true lecture needs to be targeted towards the audience that you're putting it towards. And online students are not just students that don't happen to be in the classroom that day. Okay? Now, filming yourself in the classroom is fine if you're dealing with students that might not have been able to make it to class, but they're actually live students. But you really shouldn't be using that for students that are online students. You really owe them more than that. So, you need to put together a lecture and be able to shoot a good video. How do you do that? Well, I use specific video tools for doing this that I really do like, but I lay out what I'm going to talk about. I try to keep it down to a nice, tight, concise, under 20 minute lecture. I never label my lectures, lecture one, lecture two, lecture three. They cover topics. Topics go together within the week, okay? I shoot the video, I do post-production, okay, I make sure that the video aligns with all the materials and assessments that I put together, and that helps me make a great course, okay. If you're not going to do this, you can still teach online courses. It's not going to be a great course. There's no way to create a great course without putting together the materials that really make it work well, okay. Don't come up with the excuse, I don't know how to do that. Okay, I didn't know how to do that when I first started. I never knew how to shoot video. I didn't have when I first started teaching. There wasn't even the ability to shoot video. Maybe somebody could go into a classroom and film you. Learn it. It's not that difficult. Okay, if you want to be a great online teacher, it does merit the time and effort to learn how to do good video. I can't stress that more than enough. So, I can show you some sample lectures. I'm not going to do that. One of the things I take great care to do is to make the videos interesting. So 
One of my sample lectures, and you can watch these on YouTube, I do run my own YouTube EDU channel, is importing data into SQL Server. Except that the actual video is, what is the worst food that you can eat? What I do in the video <clears throat> is I go out to the National Food Database. We have an actual database of all the nutritional contents of the food. I develop a set of criteria by which that food can be good or bad. Basically, I take added sugars and added fat and say those are the worst foods that you can possibly eat. It may not be the correct criteria 100%, but it's a good criteria to work with. I import the data into SQL Server and I run a query that lets you figure out what the worst food that you can eat is. I think you'll be able to get a big kick if you watch the video of seeing what the worst foods might possibly be. I'm sure that many of you truly enjoy at least five of those top ten worst foods. Okay, I know I really do enjoy five of those top ten worst foods, but that's how I actually make this, you know, the videos interesting. And you can do that if you're putting care into these videos. So, <clears throat> what are these elements? If you look at one of my lectures, and you'll see some of that on this lecture, I have a title slide. I introduce myself. Okay, I use embedded instructor video. And there's a whole philosophy of whether this is good or bad. It's good. Okay, students in a class need to connect with a person. I've had classes that have no video for the instructor and classes that have video for the instructor. And even the instructors I don't particularly like, I still connected with them much better when I could actually see them and relate to them. Okay, facial expressions, hand movements, all those little aspects really do add to the class. I use call-outs. I zoom in and out. I try to keep my speaking style animated. Okay, there's nothing worse than going into a lecture that is in a dull, monotone voice and is designed for one purpose, to put you to sleep. And keep it fast moving. It's not going to hurt you to go fast in a video because if a student didn't catch it, as long as you're speaking clearly, they can go back and watch it again. And many videos, I know this from my class, one of the classes I'm taking right now, which is game theory, you go back and watch over and over again, usually sitting in front of your homework trying to figure out, well, what exactly did he mean by that statement that this equation can be used in this circumstance when you're trying to solve a homework? Okay, not a problem. That's a good thing. So, um, I do have my lectures live within a video page. In other words, they actually live inside of a page. And you'll see a little bit of that here, um, just a little demonstration of what I put into a video page. I'm going to give you a little bit about the video page. Instead of just posting up, here's the link to just the video, I actually create a page for each of my videos. One is it does allow me to organize my videos a lot better, and I've created over 250 videos, so you know, ability to organize them is really important to me. But uh, the page itself allows the students and myself to have more information. Uh, myself being the fact that I come back and look at these videos later on and I want to get some information from them. So this is what I actually put into my video pages. First, I put a very short summary of what the video contains. Then I also include a prerequisite. So the prerequisites may be videos that they need to watch prior to this video, because the video may be one in a series of videos. I always put a link to the video on my YouTube EDU channel so that if they want to watch it on YouTube, they can watch it on YouTube. And I do upload all my videos to YouTube. I also put a link to the video locally within the Daytona State server. If you're inside of Daytona State College or watching on one of our computers, it runs much faster there off of our server. I put support materials. And in my video, I may use computer code, SQL scripts, I'm usually teaching classes in programming, and anything that I create in the video, I normally will also have here in my support material so you can actually see that. I also sometimes put in external resources or other things that are backup, but as you can see, the concept here is that the video is not just a video that lives by itself. It contains information and materials. If I had slides, I would put the slide presentation to go with it right here. Um, if I had resources or references, those would also go here. So the video page itself is a very useful thing. And uh, so I always create one page for every video.
Now let's talk about the interaction. There's a lot of forms of interaction, and I am only going to talk about really the bulletin board. Even though there's a lot of them that are really great, I do use them all. I use chat, I use Skype, I use email, I have group get-togethers that are actually live get-togethers. I meet with the students. But the primary form of interaction for most students is going to be the bulletin board. It's asynchronous and it's convenient. Okay? You gotta look at, you know, how are you gonna organize this? and make it work very well. So, you want to promote this interaction. Okay? Now, here's some strategies I use to promote interaction. In my classes, the assignments are due on Monday. It gives them the whole weekend to work on the assignments, and that's important to students that are working. If a student asks a question on the bulletin board on Saturday, and I don't resolve it by the time it's due, they can turn it in late. That gives them, it says, you know what? That forces them to go out to that bullet board and ask those questions as early as they can. Okay? If a student sends me an email of a question that really belongs on the bulletin board, it gets returned. Go back, post this on the bulletin board. There are things that are appropriate for email, especially if you're talking about anything that might be personal to the student. Keep that on the email or actually you know, face, in a face-to-face -face or phone interaction. But if it's a question about how to solve a problem, it goes on the bulletin board because the other students need to benefit from it also. Anything that you can do to encourage interaction in the class is going to make the class more successful. Encouraging interaction being a good thing is remember it also ties in with making sure your bulletin board is organized. So we're going to talk a little bit about how that organization works. Hi, understanding how to organize bulletin boards in an online course will actually be a very important part of how you manage an online course. And so I'm going to give you little tips, hits, and tips about how to organize this. Now, in the course that I'm teaching right now, the, the, the course is really revolving around a weekly assignment and a weekly lecture. So the bulletin board should actually manage this on a weekly basis. The easiest way for me to do that is actually tie this to the assignments. So my bulletin board has a bulletin board topic for all the way assignment one all the way through all the assignments and students are responsible for information that's up on the assignments specifically information that I post if I post it they're responsible for it I will purposefully have an assignment where there's information that they have to get from the bulletin board to force them to the bulletin board to get that information now I have some other bulletin board stuff up here like the from the instructor, which is just announcements for the class. It's very easy for me to use the bulletin board as an announcement board, but I try to keep that information separate from the assignments. If a student is working on assignment six and is having trouble with assignment six, they should be able to go to the assignment six bulletin board, ask their question, or look on that bulletin board to find information that other students have posted. Okay, it just makes it that much easier for the students that are really busy to try to figure out how to get the information that they need. So this is a very important aspect of being able to organize your course. Thanks. And the final step, assessment. Okay, now <clears throat> in the online world, there's still many methods by which you can use to assess things. And the beauty with online quizzes, which you don't have with not online quizzes, is you have the ability to randomize questions. Okay, you have the ability to um, have qu you know quiz banks, which allows you to create some very clever and interesting quizzes. And actually, a quiz in itself is a method of learning. Okay, taking a quiz, finding out what you did wrong, going out and looking out how you actually needed to solve that correctly, is a good method for teaching. So, allowing students to take multiple quizzes multiple times, especially if you have a randomized quiz bank that changes over, is not a bad strategy. It's a very good strategy. Assignments, you have to put a lot of thought and care into assignments. I use assignments in Dropbox very heavily in the stuff that I teach because I need, to, I need my students to know how to do something. I don't need them to regurgitate anything. They need to know how to actually do it. It's programming, it's databases, it's all technical stuff. It's do and do is important. Okay, so assignments work very well.
Well, since I've talked a little bit about the assignment as being one of the most important elements of an online class, or one of the very important elements, and, um, and which was really assessments, assignments and assessments, there's different ways to do assessment. Um, I'm going to take you through a little bit of how I actually do assignments. And this has been kind of gleaned from experience of working with assignments that I've taken in online classes myself. Here I've organized the on, the assess the, these pieces, but if I actually were to look at any one of these assignments, they're relatively extensive assignments. These are weekly assignments that are done by that are required by the student. Every assignment I give an objective, then I state the assignment itself. What do you need to do? Hey, what does your submission require? What do you actually have to turn in? Now, this will help the students understand what they need to turn in, but what it'll help is you to grade it because if you aren't clear on what you expect the students to turn in, you're going to have a lot of fun with grading this stuff. Then information, estimated completion time, supporting lectures, questions and answers of students that you've had, especially assignments that I use in, in you know, multiple semesters. I've got a lot of information for the student questions that they might have asked in the past that might help them out with this assignment. Any external resources that you might need to be able to complete this assignment. And what is my grading criteria? How am I actually going to grade this assignment? I don't have to get down to the details of every point, but I do want to make sure that students understand that there is partial credit because my assignments are very extensive. So in the case of the assignment that I'm looking in here, Okay, five points of the assignment, this is a data import assignment, was just demonstrating that you can successfully get the data imported. And then the last five points is being able to structure it and create the correct query to get the answer and response that you want. Okay, some students might give up saying I can't figure out how to do the query, but they were quite capable of doing the import. And they should get partial credit for that. The grading criteria being stated on the assignment allows them to understand that they can do that. Again, these are just solid organizational facts of putting together a good course, but in online courses, this becomes much more important. And as you saw, I have this, you know, this nice little assignment template that I use. It works out very well, and of course, you're more than welcome to use it. One thing that you can do, and if you have not looked at these, you need to do this. This is the future of education. It is where it's going, and you kind of want to know where the future is going. I take courses at uh, two of these two of these schools. I'm going to be taking them at a third soon because I want to learn a little bit more about how they work. I absolutely love my courses at Coursera. I haven't had a bad course from them yet, even though I've heard that there have been some bad courses. I haven't personally had one. They have over 200 and some courses listed as of today, and they've been absolutely fascinating. I've learned more from the courses that I've done and that I've taken from Coursera than I did from any of the courses I took as an undergraduate, which is saying quite a bit because I did very, you know, I, I did learn a lot in my undergraduate studies. But I found that these Coursera courses are well taught, well organized, and very challenging. So, uh, if you haven't looked at them at least, it's worth doing it. If you're truly a learner, you're going to have a very difficult time looking at Coursera and not signing up for a course because once you see that course list which I'm not going to show you here but once you see that list of courses there's going to be something in there that you are tremendously interested in and you're going to want to learn more about it that's just the way it is but it's also a good way to learn how courses can be taught online because most people learn how to lecture by watching good lectures and a lot of us never got to take online courses that are out there teaching well, the best way to learn how to do an online course is to take an online course from a good online instructor. You have something that you can emulate and learn from. So I say it's well worth your time to take a look at. One of the questions I get asked or told all the time by faculty, and I always like the statement because I have a canned response for this. I hear it all the time. Students always learn more in face-to-face -face classes than online classes. I have a simple response to that. And I actually kind of always act as prize. Really? I've been looking for the citation. You've got that citation. I take it since you know a lot about this. Can you get back, when you get back to your office, can you please send that citation to me? Because I need to use it. Okay? That citation doesn't exist. Okay? 
there are things you can do in face-to-face -face -face class as well, and there are things that you can do in online class as well. But student learning is student learning. It can be done in both environments just as effectively. Okay? It's up to the teacher or the instructor to make sure that that is effective. So you can be a great online teacher. Okay? And it takes organization, it takes a little bit of animation, but it is something that you can truly do and do well. So hopefully, this has made you think a lot about being a great online instructor. I enjoyed putting it together. Thank you very much.